Hello, my name is Lucian. I am a PhD student at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about the question about how we can find life on other planets. And that question is actually a very old one and one that humanity has been asking quite insistently for a while. Um, we're very interested in finding out whether or not we're alone in the universe. And if you just take a look at media, books, TV shows, uh, films, you'll find that actually we talk a lot and we think a lot about aliens and about the question of extraterrestrials. So it's no surprise that we've invested quite a bit of money recently over the past few decades in better telescope technology. And that technology has allowed us to find lots and lots and lots and lots of exoplanets. And that's a cool thing, right? Because these exoplanets are actually very useful for us to studying the concept of life elsewhere in the universe, because we assume that it would probably be on a planet. Um, when I talk about exoplanets here, that's a shorthand for extrasolar planet, meaning a planet outside of our own solar system. The problem about these exoplanets is that they're really, really far away. So far, in fact, that just traveling there on a spaceship isn't really a possibility right now. So if we can't travel to these planets, what can we do? Conveniently, there's an answer in biology, one of our sister sciences, and we can look at what the biologists do and take the knowledge that they have gained and use it for us in astronomy to find life on other planets. So if you think about biology, if you think about life, you might think about different types of life, for example, humans, like you and me, plants or bacteria. And these are all very different organisms, obviously, but what they all have in common is that they all metabolize. Metabolizing meaning that there is something that the organism takes in or eats or breathes in and something that the organism in turn produces or expels. So for people like you and me, for example, and most animals, in fact, we take in food and we take in oxygen through breathing and we then exhale CO2 in turn. So that's our waste product, so to say. Plants work a little bit differently. They use a process that we call photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, the plant takes in light from the sun and it takes in CO2 and in turn it produces oxygen. Bacteria are a bit more complicated because there's lots of different ways that bacteria can metabolize. One kind of bacterium that I want to look at in a little bit more detail with you today is a type of bacterium called a methanogen. And a methanogen consumes hydrogen and consumes CO2, so carbon dioxide, and in turn it produces methane. And that's where the name comes from, methanogen. And the interesting thing about these methanogens is the methane that they produce because methane as a chemical is actually very rarely produced in large quantities by non-biological processes. So most of the methane that we find on Earth is produced in one way or another by life. So if a planet has a lot of methane on it, that's probably a good indicator that there is life on there. And the way that that works is that you've got these methanogens on an exoplanet, on, a, on the surface of an exoplanet, and they'll metabolize, they'll grow, they reproduce, and what they do during that entire process is make methane. And if you have a few bacteria, you'll have a little bit of methane in the atmosphere. But if you have lots of bacteria, you'll also get lots and lots of methane in the atmosphere. Well, that's nice. And now we've got the methane in the atmosphere. But since we can't just fly to that planet and pick up a sample and measure the methane in it, how do we actually use that methane in the atmosphere to find life? What we do is we use a very cool uh, system, a very cool method called spectroscopy. And if you know a little bit about light or optics, you might know that light from a star is not actually just made of one color, but is made of lots of different colors in varying proportions, so including the light from our own sun isn't just yellow, it's actually yellow and it's blue and it's purple and it's red and all other colors. So the light is actually made of all of these different colors, or more scientifically speaking, it's made of lots of different wavelengths. And then what happens is when we observe the light that's coming at us from that star that the exoplanet is going around is that some of that light will be passing through the exoplanet's atmosphere that I've marked on that little drawing, like this light blue circle here. Um, and when that light passes through the atmosphere, there's sort of different scenarios as to what can happen. If the atmosphere of that exoplanet is very thin, there's not a lot of gas in there, no methane, no interesting stuff happening, then the light will just go through and the light will just come to Earth and then we can look at the light and you know, not much happened there. But what's really interesting is if there is methane or other gases in the atmosphere, because what these gases can do is absorb certain colors or certain wavelengths of the light that is going through the atmosphere. So in a little sketch here, you can see that the atmosphere, the methane in the atmosphere of exoplanet is absorbing the purple light and the yellow light, but it's not absorbing all of the light. It's leaving the green light and the blue light and the red light alone. 
and that's just going through completely fine. There's no nothing happening there. But the specific colors uh, in this example of purple and yellow are being absorbed. And then what happens on Earth is that we can look at the light that we receive from that star, from the exoplanet, and we can notice, oh, there's no yellow light, there's no purple light, what's going on here? And the very easy possible answer to that is that there has to be methane in the atmosphere of that exoplanet that has absorbed all of that purple and yellow light. In reality, it's a bit more complicated, a bit more nuanced than that. Specifically, the it's not a, an all or nothing thing. Uh, the more gas we have, the more light is absorbed. So if we have only a few methanogens and only a little bit of methane in the atmosphere, most of the yellow and purple light is actually still going to get through to Earth to us. Um, but if we have lots of these methanogens, and in turn they're producing lots of methane, they'll actually absorb more and more of the yellow and purple light, making it much easier to tell if there's methanogens present or methane present in the atmosphere, and in turn infer the existence of methanogens on the planet. In actuality, it's a, still a bit more complicated than that, because what we do is not actually look at colours, but we look at wavelengths, which is sort of a one-to-one -one translation, colours to wavelengths. And we plot what we call a spectrum, hence the name spectroscopy, um, and we can look at the spectrum. And what you saw previously with the absence of colours in a spectrum looks like a hole in the spectrum. So you can see here, both on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, there's these sort of dips in the spectrum. And rather than having like the light being, the colour being more or less intensely absorbed, we can see that there's bigger holes if there's more light absorbed of that specific wavelength, or smaller holes if less light is absorbed. So that sort of gives us an idea about how much methane is present in the atmosphere and how much light has actually been absorbed by that methane. So these spectra that I've drawn here were obviously a bit crude, so I made a little simulation for you guys. Um, what we see here on this plot, it's a little bit complicated, but I'll step you through it. Um, what we're seeing is Earth spectrum as viewed from somebody who might be on a different planet. Uh, viewing that spectrum with oxygen present and without oxygen present. So you can see the blue line here is what Earth spectrum would look like if we didn't have any oxygen. Um, and the red line you can see is what Earth spectrum looks like with what we call present atmospheric levels of oxygen. That's what the PAL stands for. And present atmospheric levels is about 20% oxygen. So this is the difference between no oxygen and 20% of oxygen. And you can see, like I was talking about previously, quite clearly here, is that the presence of oxygen in large quantities in the atmosphere causes a hole in the spectrum, where you can very clearly see that there's a big difference between what the spectrum looks like with no oxygen present, which is the blue line, and the spectrum with the oxygen present. So if we're looking at this spectrum and we're just seeing this big hole, then we can guess, well, there's probably oxygen around. But if that hole isn't there, then we can guess that there probably isn't any oxygen around. In fact, spectra even look a bit more complicated than this still. So I've made, I've, I've shown you here a little graph that I actually made as part of my research recently. But I, I think even this complicated graph, even if you don't understand everything about it, just looking at it, tells us something very interesting. And I'll briefly explain what I mean here. We can see again in blue, we've got the uh, case with very little methane in the atmosphere, only 0.1% of the atmosphere being methane. And then on the right and the left hand side on the panel in red, we've got the case of 1% of methane. On the right hand side, we've got the case of 10% of methane. So 1% or 10% of all of the gas in the atmosphere being methane respectively. And we can see the difference between those two red lines, quite striking actually, is the depth of the different um, holes that we see in the spectrum. You can see here, for example, this hole on the left panel is actually very small and very easy to miss potentially, while on the right hand side it's actually very large. So there's a lot of methane uh, in the atmosphere that has absorbed lots of the light at this specific wavelength, causing this large dip. And that's ideally what we want. Ideally we want these large holes in the atmosphere uh, in the spectrum caused by the large amount of methane in the atmosphere so that we can confidently infer the existence of methane and confidently therefore infer the existence of some kind of methane producing organism. That was a lot of information in a really short amount of time so what I'll do is briefly summarize what we learned today. So we've learned that organisms metabolize and when they do that they produce gases. These gases can then gather in the atmosphere of an exoplanet and light from the star that the exoplanet is going around passes through the atmosphere on its way to us on Earth. Some of that light is absorbed in the atmosphere by methane being present, for example, and that light will then be missing from the spectrum that we can see with our telescope on Earth. The deeper the hole in that spectrum is, the more gas there is present on the exoplanet, and more gas usually means that there is more life.
Thank you very much for paying attention. Hope you learned something useful today and I hope you enjoyed it.